much our daily lives have changed, how much our societies evolved over, let's say, the past thousand years. Back in the Middle Ages, we didn't have central heating. We had to use the skins of animals to keep us warm. We had to hunt every day for our food. We lived under a constant threat of neighboring tribes attacking us and killing us for our resources. Today, we've got it made. <laughs> Times are much different because we don't have to necessarily worry about that moment-to-moment -moment threat to our survival. We can buy everything from the luxury of our comfortable couch, on the internet, without ever having to deal with another human being. Isn't it an amazing time to be alive? But there's a problem. Our brain hasn't evolved to match the evolution of society. Now, when we're talking evolution, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. So those past thousand years that I just mentioned, that's just a mere blip on the evolutionary timeline. So what we're left with is a way of life in a society that's at odds with the way the brain evolved. Because our brain evolved with one thought in mind, maximize our chance of survival. And the way it's done that is to wire itself to be very sensitive to monitoring for and detecting and reacting to threat. So when you study the brain, it's clear that that's pretty much one of the basic operating principles that our brain uses to guide our behavior. Safety first. Because if our brain doesn't feel safe, it can't enjoy anything. All right, so you've got this old wired brain, and its default mode is to assume that something or someone is dangerous until they prove that they're safe. Now think about how this plays out with relationships. You meet someone for the first time. Your brain is going to immediately categorize them into one of two groups, friend or foe. Or as we refer to in the neuroscience field, in-group versus out-group. And this is pretty much solely based upon how similar this person is to me. Do they look like me? Do they sound like me? Do they share my cultural norms? Now, what's maddening about all this is it happens pretty much below our level of awareness, below our level of consciousness. Because this brain of ours, this complex machine, more complex than any computer we can imagine, with its 85 billion plus neurons, it needs to be efficient. If it's not efficient, it's not going to work. So what it's realized through evolution is to be efficient, it has to automate as much as it can without you having to think about it or deal with it. Now, we as humans, we're not a slave to this lower, older brain of ours, okay? We have this amazing thing called a higher brain. And it's new from an evolutionary perspective. This higher brain of ours does some astounding things that we think make us uniquely human. It allows us to do things like think about our own thinking. All right? It allows us to take someone else's perspective, even if we don't agree with them. But importantly, what this higher brain does is it acts literally as a break on that lower brain. Okay, it, it, there's, there's this symbiotic relationship, a yin and yang, between the higher brain and the lower brain. And that's important for us as humans. A good analogy that I use when I teach this is that of Star Wars, where you've got Darth Vader. <laughs> Darth Vader, been around for a long time, powerful, trying to harness the dark side of the Force to rule the galaxy, right? That's like our older brain, our lower brain. And our newer brain is like Luke Skywalker. He's the new kid on the block, right? From an evolutionary perspective, our newer brain, our higher brain, is new. And Luke is trying to harness the good side of the Force to prevent that dark side from controlling the universe, or in this case, to prevent that lower brain from driving our behaviors and decision-making process. Now, this is great because you have this yin and yang relationship, but it's a constant struggle for our higher brain to manage that lower brain of ours, which is always underneath the surface, just lurking to appear. Now, what happens when we rely too much on this old automatic brain of ours is that biases emerge. You're probably familiar with what biases are, but from a neuroscience standpoint, we see biases as simply a mental shortcut. It's a way of reacting or making decisions that pretty much bypasses that higher logical reasoning brain. So what we as humans need to do is be able to rise above these biases.
to use that higher brain to inform us what's making our decisions, what's driving our behavior, so we're not literally a slave to this lower brain of ours. And we can do that. Take, for example, today's notion of stressors. Our stressors today are pretty much internally generated, as opposed to externally generated, which is the way they were upon the time the brain evolved. Our stressors are things like, is my kid going to get into college? How am I going to pay for it? Is my pizza crust gluten-free? You know, these hardcore things. Very different than those stressors that occurred when our brain was evolving. But the problem is the brain doesn't know the difference. It's still going to react in that fight-or-flight mode, even to these contemporary stressors. And even though we're not running away from a wild animal or fighting an enemy to the death, this brain is still going to react like that. So what we need to be able to do is manage this. We need to be able to do things like change our perception, reappraise our stressors. There's some evidence showing that by simply reappraising a stressor and seeing it as a test or something to build your character, it can actually go a long way to helping that. Let me give you an example of how this perception thing can work with a stressor. You see this picture on the screen. What's your immediate reaction? Probably one of joy, happiness, all the hopefulness of a bride on her wedding day, right? It probably wouldn't be one of panic and anxiety. And that's exactly what I felt when I saw a picture of my daughter in her wedding dress for the first time. <laughs> Because I knew she was going to get married, but until I saw her in her dress, it really didn't hit home for me. I started to get, my hands started to get clammy, I started to sweat. My heart started to race. My mind started to race. How can my youngest daughter, my only daughter, do this? Who's this guy she's marrying? Who's paying for the wedding? These type of things. <laughs> Now, all the time around me, people were sharing it on Facebook and Twitter and laughing. It was maddening to me. I was perceiving this, this stimuli as a stress, whereas other people weren't. But it's a good illustration of how our perception of our world can drive our stressors. And that's not a trivial point, because our perception, the way we see our stressors, can really dictate how these stressors affect our brain. And yes, stress affects your brain, and it does it in some pretty nasty ways. Particularly if you perceive your stressors as something that's out of your control. So if you feel helpless, if you feel like you're a victim, that's sort of a worst-case scenario. Because what we're finding in the field of neuroscience is that when you have that mentality, stress can actually physically decrease the size of that higher brain. It decreases its functionality, and now you've got an imbalance between that higher brain and lower brain. That higher brain that acts as a brake. Think of what happens when a car goes downhill out of control. You apply the brakes, and you stop the car. This is what our higher brain does. It acts as a brake on that lower brain. Stress weakens that brake. Now, there's ways to manage this stress, right? We can work around our perception and our mindset. We could take other people's perspectives to manage this in-group versus out-group thing. Researchers at Harvard University have demonstrated that if you take a first-person perspective of someone else's situation, you know, you've heard probably all your life from your grandmother, oh, put yourself in someone else's shoes. But we're actually seeing that this works. If you do this, If you take, in this case, a written perspective, first-person perspective of someone's situation, you actually use the part of your brain that's utilized to consider yourself when thinking about that other person. So you're physically using a different part of your brain to deal with someone mentally when you do this. And if you can do that, you can avoid, to some extent, this whole in-group versus out-group that this old brain of ours wants to push us to. So some other ways to be able to do this, to manage this, this old brain of ours, is to focus directly on strengthening that higher brain. One of the ways we've found in the field of neuroscience that, that looks promising is mindfulness meditation. And the story seems to be that mindfulness meditation appears to directly strengthen that higher brain, that break. Now, we all know, we've heard what mindfulness meditation is. It's been around for thousands of years. It's helped millions of people, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't have been around for thousands of years. But what we're seeing is that it's causing a, this, this balance to come back. It can actually negate the effects of stress on the brain. 
And we've seen this in studies. You can physically see an increase in the size of the higher brain with mindfulness training. Again, bringing that balance back. Other ways to do this, to strengthen a higher brain, exercise. There's a lot of research now in the field of neuroscience suggesting that exercise can have a very beneficial effect on that higher brain. Maybe in a different way than mindfulness. It appears to increase these natural chemicals in our brain. We call them growth factors. And these chemicals serve to sort of do housekeeping on our higher brain, because we've got 85 billion neurons working. There's a lot going on. So they do daily repair. But the other thing they do is allow the brain to wire itself to grow and to learn. So exercise seems to be a real promising technique as well. Now, the reason I'm harping on this so much is because you can't really underestimate how important this higher brain is for us as humans. All right, now, let me show you an example of a study that was done not long ago, illustrating this point very vividly. This was a study done by Zhu and his colleagues a few years ago and published in the Journal of Neuroscience. And it asked a simple question. Does our brain respond the same way to someone who's in pain based on whether or not they're the same race as me? Okay, so what they did in this study, they took subjects, put them in an MRI machine, and imaged their brain. They imaged, in particular, the area of the brain that deals with empathy, empathy for pain. Okay, so they did this imaging of the brain while these students were watching actors in a video clip in pain. And in this case, what they had was a needle being applied to the cheek. So what they asked, simple question, does the brain respond the same way to someone who's in my group, from my same race, or from my out group? And not surprisingly, when they looked at the brain response from someone from my same race, they saw, yes, that empathy area of the brain fired, fired quickly, very, very high. But disturbingly, when they looked at people observing someone in pain who was not from their own race, that empathy area of the brain did not fire. And this is, these are actually the data right here from that study. You could see the significant difference in the empathy activity of the brain solely based upon whether or not the person in pain was from my race or not. A huge difference. This is at the level of the neurons, this in-group versus out-group thing playing, playing out. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, because again, we as humans have this higher brain. We can manage this, right? And what they did in the study was actually ask the subjects, how do you feel about these people in pain? Rate your empathy. How empathetically would you behave towards them? And what the students replied with is whether or not they were from their own race, they still would respond empathetically to them. So a great example of this old brain of ours trying to rear up its ugly head with this in-group versus out-group thing, but the higher brain stepping in and managing it before it can even emerge. But remember what I said about stress. Stress can really impact this higher brain particularly the way we perceive our stress. You know, we've made some astounding technological advances just in the past couple decades. Advances that hold great hope for our future generations. But at the end of the day, we are still at the mercy of this lower brain of ours, this old emotional brain. And all you have to do is look at the events from just this past year in places like Paris, Istanbul, Brussels, Dallas, Orlando, the list goes on and on. If we can just create some awareness, some self-awareness, about how the brain dictates our behavior, how this lower brain acts, and tie into that some of the research in neuroscience showing how to manage this, how to optimize our higher brain, then maybe we can make some astounding sociological advances as well as technological advances for future generations. Thank you.